flows. And the purpose of the statement of cash flows is to reconcile our beginning cash balance with our ending cash balance. In other words, we want to find out, you know, what activities related to the operations of our business are bringing in and causing us to spend cash. Where are we investing cash, right? Um, and where are we getting financing from, right? So those three sections explain or reconcile our beginning and ending cash balance together, okay? Um, but we're going to focus just on the operating section, all right? So we're going to start by taking a look at the direct method. Then we're going to talk about the indirect method. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we'll go over some of the more um, administrative stuff. Okay. So the direct method, this is the method that's preferred under US GAAP. Um, and with the direct method, what we're doing is we're taking our income statement and we're converting each line item on the income statement to its cash equivalent. So revenue, which is an accrual number, we're trying to convert that to cash received from customers. Cost of goods sold, once again, an accrual item, we're trying to convert that to cash paid out for inventory. And then for all of our operating expenses, we convert those from their accrual form to the relevant cash outflow for that particular operating expense. Um, now, one thing I want to point out, maybe you didn't know this, but you're required to disclose the cash paid for interest and cash paid for taxes under the direct method since we're breaking everything out on our income statement and showing the cash inflows or outflows associated with it. We don't have to make that disclosure because it's already kind of disclosed in the presentation of the direct method. Um, but with the indirect method, which we'll take a look at afterwards, we don't get that same detail. We don't get the same breakout. And so you're required to disclose the interest and the taxes paid under the indirect method because it's not clear how much has been paid due to the way that we go about using the indirect method. Okay. Um, now for the direct method, I like to show people this little tool, if you will. Uh, it's basically a matrix or a table that we use to prepare the direct section of the statement of cash flows. Now, why do I recommend this? Well, one, it helps keep your information organized. That's really important. And two, that final box over on the right-hand side where it says statement of cash flows, that's your answer. So it's helping you keep your work organized, but once you're done, you basically have your entire you know, operating section that's been prepared neatly in one little column. Um, so it's very handy tool. Um, let's go ahead and practice. We're gonna be taking a look at a task-based simulation today. Um, we've been given two exhibits, right? Um, our first one is the income statement for DWC Corporation. They give us revenue cogs. We've got some salaries expense, some other operating expenses, interest, depreciation, a gain, and then some income tax. Now our balance sheet, note the years, right? Our first column is going to be our year two balance or beginning balance for year three. And then our, our far right column, that represents our ending balance or our end of year three balance, okay? Um, so we've got AR, inventory prepaid, and then we've got our current liabilities. So like I mentioned, what we're doing is we're going to start at the top of our income statement, and we're going to convert each one of these into its cash basis equivalent. Think of it as like converting from accrual to cash, okay? So um, step one is we just take our income statement, and then we slot it into our direct method table, right? That's all we do. We don't have to um, we don't have to make any adjustments to it. We literally just take it and then drop it down into our matrix, right? Exactly how it's presented to us. Now the bulk of the work is going to be in this adjustment column here. That's where we make the adjustments to convert each accrual based item to its cash equivalent. So let's start with unearned revenue, okay? We're, we're taking our revenue income statement item, right? And we're gonna convert that into cash. And in order to do that, 
basically what we're going to be doing, and this is just kind of summarizing, we're going to we're going to take our balance sheet accounts that are related to this income statement item, and we're going to use those accounts to determine what adjustment needs to be made. Okay. So looking at unearned revenue on our balance sheet, our beginning balance is 4,100 and our ending balance is 3,300. Now I'm very much a T account person. I think T accounts are the way to go. They're very visual and they're easy to create. And you can also end up creating journal entries to help you better understand where things go in the T account. Um, I do not like to use the roll forward method. If you wanna use that, that's great. But I think the T accounts are a lot easier to assemble and kind of check your work with. So unearned revenue, this is a liability, right? Unearned or deferred revenue represents money you were paid for goods or services you haven't or hadn't yet completed yet. So our beginning balance is 4,100, our ending balance is 3,300. What this tells us is that our deferred revenue decreased, right? In other words, we earned $800 of revenue that was previously deferred. If we were to tell a story with this, you know, maybe we own a lawn care business. We're paid $4,100 up front to mow lawns, you know, while a particular client is out of town. Um, and, you know, at the end of the first, at the end of the first month, excuse me, we've done $800 worth of the work. Well, if once we've completed part of the work, we pull it out of deferred revenue because it's no longer deferred. We've now earned the revenue associated with the cash that we previously received, right? So $800 then is what we are recognizing as revenue. And the journal entry we would make for that is we would debit deferred revenue, which is evidenced in our T account, and we would credit revenue, right? So within that $20,000 accrual revenue number, we have $800 of deferred revenue or previously deferred revenue kind of baked in there. Now, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to convert that 20,000 into cash, right? That $800 of previously deferred revenue is not connected to cash collections in the current period. It represents revenue we've earned for cash we were previously paid. So what we wanna do here is we wanna subtract out that 800 because it's pure accrual revenue. There's no cash inflow associated with this revenue um, in the current period, right? At least not based off the information they've given us because we start the year with the balance of 4,100. The balance isn't going up, meaning you know, we're, not getting the, we're not getting additional cash in year three right? All of the cash was paid to us in year two, or maybe even in year one. We're just now earning that revenue in year three. Okay, so we want to back it out because that 800, like I said, is not related to cash we collected from customers in the current period. It's us earning cash that we were paid in a prior period. Um, any questions about that? That can be a little bit tricky to understand conceptually, so don't feel bad at all if you have any questions or need extra clarification on that. Everyone feeling good with that? Yeah, um, this is to say we're kind of doing an, an adjusted entry right here, right? I mean, if you look at it on a journal entry perspective. So we're not... We would make an adjusting entry with the the 800, right? We would debit deferred revenue and credit unearned revenue, right. but we don't right. actually make a journal entry when we back out the 800. This is just a calculation we do to help us determine what the cash collected from customers is, but we're not actually going to change or update our books to reflect this. It's more of like, think of um, with like consolidated financial statements, Mm -hmm. The entries you make to get rid of the intercompany stuff, those are not like oh, permanent entries. Okay. They're just like entries you use while you're kind of preparing the worksheet. Same kind of concept. Makes sense. Okay. Perfect. Um, so we, we're going to back out 800. Now let's look at accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is our other balance sheet related item that's connected to revenue, right? As we 
make sales on account, our revenue goes up, but so does our AR, okay? Now we've already determined that within that $20,000 revenue number, we have $800 that was previously deferred that we've now earned. If we back that out, then that will tell us the remaining portion of our revenue that is just related to current period credit sales. Okay, so total revenue is 20K. 800 of that came from earning previously deferred money. The other 19,200 then is credit sales we made in the current period. Okay, so we wanna back the 800 out because we're trying to isolate the amount of credit sales made in the current period so we can populate our AR account. We plug in our beginning balance and our ending balance. And then with the 19,200, we can stick that right here on the debit side. The missing piece of our T account represents the cash that we've collected for sales we've made on account. In other words, that's our answer, right? The whole kind of objective here was to convert our accrual based revenue into cash we collected from our customers, which is found in the AR account, specifically on the credit side. So all we have to do is just solve for the missing piece. And a, a little tip that you can use to kind of back into the missing piece of the T account, you just take the difference between your beginning and ending account, right? And, and you're trying to analyze what's happening in the account. So the account here is going down by 200 bucks. Our beginning balance is 1,000. We end with 800, meaning the account saw an overall decrease of $200. If the account went down, it means we collected more cash than what we generated in current year credit sales by $200, right? So if we're collecting more than we're selling and the account went down by $200, it means we must be collecting $200 more than what we're selling. So you basically just take 19,200, add 200 and you get to the 19,400, okay? So the total adjustments that we'll make then, or the net adjustment is gonna be a negative 600. We back out $800 to get us to the 19,200, and then we add $200 to convert that accrual-based sales revenue number of 19,200 to 19,400. So when you take the 20,000 and then subtract the net of those two, you are left with 19,400, which is the cash we receive from our customers. Um, any questions about this one? Our revenue account is a little bit trickier in this example because we've got two balance sheet items that we're having to account for, namely AR and unearned revenue. Some of the other items we're going to look at don't have that. They have one balance sheet account. Some of them don't even have any, and those ones are very easy to work through. But this one's a little bit more complicated because we've got two things on our balance sheet related to that line item on our item statement. Okay, how's everyone feeling so far? Is this making sense? Uh, 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 so um, how about that would come to play in this particular illustration? Sorry, could you repeat that one more time? Yeah, yeah I was just asking if we have a bad debt expense here. Like oh, bad debt. Okay, how, yeah. How, how this would change the whole illustration here? What would so it be? It, yeah, that's a good question. It kind of depends on the information they provide to you. Um, if they were to give you like net accounts receivable, then that's okay. probably what you would end up using. Okay. Um, now, if they gave you gross AR and then bad debt, then you would have right. to net them together. Um, because really, we want to be looking at net accounts receivable. Um, okay. And the reason for that is net accounts receivable represents what we actually expect that we're going to collect. Right. Oh. Um, gross AR represents all the sales on account we've made. But once we take into account bad debt, it leaves us with the amount of credit sales we expect we're going to be able to collect. And so we want to go off of that because it's more accurate. No question. Okay, so up next, 
We have cost of goods sold. Um, this is another tricky one. I don't think it's as tricky as re 